everybody, I'm Lauren Underwood, and I have the honor of representing Illinois' 14th Congressional District in the U.S. House of Representatives. I'm delighted to be joining you for the National Health and Climate Forum as part of the 10th Annual American Climate Leadership Summit. As the leaders gathered for the summit know as well as anyone, the warning signs on climate change have been flashing red for decades. If the average global temperature continues to rise at its current pace, the impacts could be catastrophic. With a two degree Celsius increase in coming decades, sea levels will continue to rise, more ecosystems will be irreparably damaged, and natural resource supplies will likely be depleted. But today's forum is an urgent reminder that climate change is not just a future danger or an abstract one. It's an immediate threat that is directly affecting people's lives right now, including in our own communities in the United States. Climate change is creating new environmental health risks and exacerbating existing ones, like our nation's maternal mortality crisis, a crisis that's been worsening for my entire lifetime. The U.S. already has the highest maternal mortality rate in the developed world and significant racial and ethnic disparities in outcomes. Infant mortality rates are also higher for black families and other communities of color, even after controlling for variables like income. While the drivers of these trends are multifaceted, the role of climate change in fueling adverse maternal and infant health outcomes and disparities, well, it's indisputable. In 2020, in June of 2020, researchers published a groundbreaking systematic review in the Journal of the American Medical Association, which assessed the effects of environmental risks on more than 32 million births in the United States. The study's authors concluded that the exacerbation of air pollution and heat exposure related to climate change may be significantly associated with risks to pregnancy outcomes, and the subpopulations at highest risk were, were women and birthing people of color, particularly black moms. As a registered nurse, I was alarmed, but honestly not surprised by these findings. My nursing education grounded me in an understanding of the role of non-clinical factors like environmental conditions in influencing health outcomes. When I served as a senior advisor at the Department of Health and Human Services, I worked on the Flint water crisis, and I saw how the disease burden of public health emergencies often takes a disproportionate toll on communities of color, a rattling reality that has been laid bare throughout the COVID-19 pandemic as well. And as a member of Congress and the co-founder and co-chair of the Black Maternal Health Caucus, the JAMA article compelled me to develop data-driven policy solutions to tackle this crisis head on. The result? Well, it's the Protecting Moms and Babies Against Climate Change Act, which I introduced with Senator Ed Markey in February 2021. The Protecting Moms and Babies Against Climate Change Act would invest in community-based programs to identify climate change risks for pregnant and postpartum people and their infants, provide them with necessary support, and mitigate exposure to those environmental risks, particularly in communities of color. The funding supports doulas and community health workers, provides direct financial assistance to patients, strengthens community forestry initiatives, improves monitoring systems and data sharing, and prepares future nurses, doctors, and other healthcare workers to identify and address climate-related risks for their patients. The Protecting Moms and Babies Against Climate Change Act, H.R. 957, makes critical investments to save lives and end racial and ethnic disparities in maternal and infant health outcomes. I'm committed to working with my House and Senate colleagues and the Biden-Harris administration to get this legislation enacted. We don't have time to wait. Our moms and babies are worth it. The health of our communities depends on it, and this moment demands it. Thank you for your commitment to this cause, and thank you again for the opportunity to be with you for the National Health and, C and Climate Forum. I look forward to the day that we're back together again in person, but until then, take good care of yourselves. Thank you so much, Representative Underwood, for your remarks today and for your ongoing leadership on the Hill. To talk further about climate change, maternal health, and reproductive justice, I am joined by Kelly Davis, Vice President of Global Birth Equity and Innovation at the National Birth Equity Collaborative. Welcome, Kelly, and thanks so much for joining us. I'm so happy to be here. 
Can you start off by telling us a little more about how climate change is exacerbating maternal health outcomes, especially for Black women? So as Representative Underwood stated, America is in the midst of a maternal health crisis, despite the fact that we have unparalleled health care spending. In the United States, we're the only high-income nation where maternal mortality is on the rise. And really, the thing that is fueling our crisis is the maternal morbidity and mortality for Black women and other people of color. Traditionally, when we think about maternal mortality, um, folks might think that the only spaces of, of intervention are in clinical or healthcare settings. However, it is becoming increasingly clear that um, structural racism and gender oppression has been proven whether the bodies of Black women and pregnant people before, during, or after pregnancy. And so what that means is that the environments that Black women are in, including exposure to climate change sexually and other environmental risk, really um, affect the health of pregnancy and birth outcomes generally. Also because women of color are, have yet to achieve equal pay for equal work, again, because of racism and sexism, um, when climate crises do occur, we're less likely to be able to deal with them or mitigate, mitigate the effects of climate change. Uh, and I can give you a few examples of how we know that pregnancy really hasn't been highlighted the way that it needs to in emergency preparedness, climate change research, and policy and advocacy. Uh, this year, Human Rights Watch reviewed over 100 emergency preparedness plans, heat advisories, um, climate change web uh, pages from a variety of jurisdictions. And after reviewing over 105 documents, pregnancy, the word pregnancy was only mentioned two times, wow. right? So pregnant women, pregnant people keep falling through the cracks, um, even though we are, tend to be hyper exposed to uh, the impacts of climate change. By contrast, when we look at those same documents, Pets were mentioned nearly 40 times. So my dog, Bernie, I know what to do in a climate emergency or um, a disaster for my dog, um, more so than I would for the pregnant women in my life. And that's truly unacceptable. Uh, we saw this, an example for winter storm Uri, which impacted the uh, southern United States not that long ago. Um, already the United States uh, in the South is where we find the highest parts, uh, highest rates of chronic conditions, also maternal mortality and morbidity. States like Louisiana, Texas, Mississippi, Alabama have high rates of maternal mortality. Mm -hmm. um, and we saw there that folks went over a month without really having potable water, without having electricity. And that has a supreme impact, a negative deleterious impact on the health of Black birthing people. Um, without water, pregnant people need more water than those who are not pregnant, right? Because they are growing organs of, of a baby. They are, the, the increased water supports the blood volume for the baby. Infants require uh, water to, to live, right, and, and formula. So when we talk about jurisdictions like Jackson, Mississippi, which has over 80% Black residents, it's where my whole entire family resides, mm -hmm. uh, and when they don't have, when you don't have heat and hot water or drinkable water for two to six weeks, what do we expect? Of course, that is going to have an income on the health of pregnancy and birth. Yep. Yeah, no, thanks so much. Uh, and I think that really, that explanation really helped demonstrate the need for the solutions that Representative Underwood was talking about. You know, something else that Representative Underwood said um, was that she was alarmed, but not surprised mm -hmm. by the results of the systematic review demonstrating disproportionate impact of heat and air pollution on Black birth outcomes. And, you know, I've heard that reaction before uh, when talking about these issues. And so, so what, what is your reaction uh, to that? And how are we supporting the lived experience of Black birthing people through science and through policy? 
I have to say I agree with Representative Underwood's sentiments. Um, if you work in reproductive justice, if you work in health care and public health, if you uh, understand racial equity, um, none of this is uh, surprising. Uh, you're shocked by the magnitude. And of course, when we think about environmental justice or climate change in our cities, uh, or actually across uh, rural and suburban neighborhoods. Uh, the history of America has been rife with structural racism and gender oppression in every facet of society, including housing and transportation. So many Black neighborhoods have been demolished through eminent domain in order to create parks and playgrounds for the uh, wealthy white people. I live in New York City, where I've resided for over 15 years. And uh, I didn't know, I recently just found out um, that a whole entire black neighborhood existed in middle Manhattan that the government demolished to create Central Park. So uh, we know about displacement, gentrification that displaces um, black and brown people uh, and, and causes them to move to less desirable parts of society. Um, we have higher exposures to heat as a result, right? So when you don't have green space, um, you are more than likely to be in a hotter neighborhood as a result of climate change. We live in areas where highways were placed through Black neighborhoods, resulting in higher rates of asthma, which contributes to maternal morbidity and mortality. Um, obesity, where folks are afraid to have their children outside and play. You can't play outside because a highway has gone through your neighborhood. Um, these are all the ways that structural racism impacts environmental uh, conditions uh, uh, for Black people, including Black birthing people. So I had to say that uh, I was shocked, by, but also not surprised, because it's been my lived experience. I've been displaced. I've had family members that I have been displaced. Um, redlining is still very much alive today. So the policies and practices that's, that the government divested from Black neighborhoods and immigrant neighborhoods, um, predatory loans, all of these things are still affecting um, Black wealth and health today. Related to um, heat stress, heat exposure, and pregnancy outcomes, um, studies continue to prove that premature birth, so prematurity and low birth weight, are the leading preventable cause of infant death um, in this country, uh, we found that exposure uh, had a really poor impact causing premature birth and ex uh, from exposure to heat for Black and Asian American mothers. Another study found that white or college-educated mothers had faced fewer impacts than others, probably likely to the uh, their socioeconomic status and ability to attain air conditioning, green space, leave in automobiles, and certain things of that nature. Also in the U.S., Black people and Native American indigenous folks have less air conditioning coverage, right? Um, Air conditioning electricity costs a great deal. And so they spend a, a, a greater proportion of their income on electricity and cooling costs. Um, and considering the fact that they're also more likely to be rent burdened, again, because of redlining and structural racism, um, this really causes like a, a kind of domino effect of it's hot in my neighborhood because. Uh, of redlining, transportation, structural racism, and I can't afford ways to cool myself. And mm -hmm. that is, that is, um, it impacts health overall, but specifically during pregnancy. Yeah. Yeah. And I know, um, you know, a friend of mine just had, had a baby. He's adorable. Um, but she, you know, she talked about how hot she was all the time, right? Like you're, you're, you know, you're growing a human, like it's, it's a lot of energy and a lot of work and you get hot. So I can only imagine in those places that are going to, that are, you know, hotter in the summer, um, and particularly you mentioned redlining, you know, I know there's work that shows that there, even within the same city, there can be a 12 degree difference on the same yes. day, depending yes. on where you are. Um, and if you're also busy growing a human, uh, you might, you might, you know, that's exacerbated. You're just hot. And so we, we do need to think about that and access to air conditioning and cooling spaces, right? And how do we provide cooling spaces in, in a pandemic when you're supposed to be socially distancing? And I think, you know, you're bringing up so many important ideas for how we plan and build resiliency. You know, I think the last panel did a great job of ditching some of that doom and gloom that we always talk about, uh, 
you know, and, and you're doing that too, really bringing in these ideas about how to build resiliency and build and build towards healthy and equitable and just birth outcomes. Um, and so really, you know, with the, with the few minutes that we have left, I, you know, what can people do now in their communities to support this work? Um, and how can they support federal action as well, sort of thinking about that uh, local action, national purpose theme uh, for the summit? Well, there's a, a whole host of things that we can do on the, on the individual, um, institutional, and structural level. I really encourage folks to continue on their anti-racist journey, particularly within climate change. Oftentimes, we're in spaces um, that are controlled by only uh, white cisgendered men, uh, and, and that's reflected in the solutions and the science that we continue um, to perpetuate and create. Um, so obviously, we need to work on decolonizing the movement uh, in response to climate change, including not only representation from folks that are most affected by environmental racism, but really thinking about some of the things that we promote. I continue to hear in climate change circles, folks really advance the narrative that an evidence-based strategy for climate change is contraceptive access. And I just want to be very clear that that is a racist argument that's steeped in eugenics. Mm -hmm. um, and particularly right now, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, the world has lost in excess of a million people. And so to continue to think about like births or individual uh, reproductive autonomy being tied to um, what is happening uh, as a result of like multinational corporations or limiting births in Sub-Saharan Africa or South Asia, when those countries and people are not responsible for the majority of, of taking up the world's resources, again, it's really steeped in racism and goes against a lot of the tenets of um, reproductive justice. Um, so along with decolonizing climate change, who's in the room, uh, also the, the solutions, academic centers get millions in research for funding, right? But don't really invest in citizen science or even collaborating with communities that experience the worst harms um, and have actually the solutions within them um, and have been really on the forefront. I'm talking about um, Native communities, um, Black communities have really been on the forefront of citizen science and community-centered research and advocacy even before the term climate change was coined. Yet they're kind of sidelined when it comes to the dollars, the partnerships, and advocacy. Um, I want to continue to advocate for pregnant people having access to cooling, such as air conditioning and cooler houses housing through energy assistance programs and tax rebate programs for free, um, making sure workplace protections are in place for pregnant workers, including right to pregnancy accommodations. Folks work, folks in farming, folks in retail work in very, very hot accommodations where they cannot have access to water, restroom breaks, or shade. And that has a that has an awful impact on birth outcomes. Um, we must continue to advocate for sustainable communities, right? Um, these are the things that we know uh, will actually change not only birth outcomes, but health comes overall, right? Including access to green, green space, community gardens, all the things that support um, healthy lives, and not only healthy lives, but like fulfilling joyful lives, access to nature, green space, and clean air. Yeah, and I think you know what what you just said. It's so true. You know what we do for what we do that's good for the planet is usually good for our health, and what we do for, that's good for our health is usually good for the planet. And so you know, stop siloing these ideas, uh, and let's you know and what we're going to hear about in the next session a little bit. You know, is is multi solving like we let's take on all of these at once. Oh, it's too much. No, no, no. What we keep hearing all the time, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. Well, you know what? We can address the climate crisis and improve uh, birth equity at the same time. I that's really right. Yeah, so I, I I really appreciate that. Uh, you know, I think we, we were talking a little bit earlier. You know, I had to follow Gina McCarthy this morning, and now we had to follow Representative Lauren Underwood and the great work she's doing. And I couldn't have asked for a better uh, a partner in this discussion. So I just want to thank you so much uh, for joining us. And we had a live fact check: uh, progesterone levels increase during pregnancy, which makes women feel extra warm. So thanks to all the OBGYNs listening, uh, and for the the live fact check on what we're talking about today. Um, so I appreciate that. And I, um, 
Kelly, I just want to thank you again um, for joining us. And um, I encourage everybody to follow the work of the National Birth Equity Collaborative as we advance climate solutions that promote health equity and justice. Thank you so much, Kelly. Thank you for having me. And now we will hear from Dr. Joshua Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, who's going to share his reflections on COVID-19 solutions that multi-solve for climate. Hello, National Climate Leadership Summit. It's great to be here. I am Josh Sharfstein from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, and my topic is listening to COVID-19, lessons for climate. It's been a long and terrible year. By the time you see this, there'll be more than 3 million deaths from COVID-19 in people all around the world. The global map has gotten redder and redder. And for those who care about the condition of the planet, it's also gotten more and more familiar. So that led me to ask, what can we learn by listening to COVID-19 to help us address the existential challenge posed by climate change? It's an important question. So as befitting all important questions during these work from home times, I rolled up my pajama sleeves, logged into my computer, and typed something into Google. In this case, what are the lessons from COVID-19? So it turns out there are quite a lot of lessons out there from COVID-19. How many? Well, the internet has not quite agreed upon yet. I knew I had to do better than this but then I started clicking on the various links and kind of lost track of time. So here's the good news. I did learn the lessons of COVID-19 for restaurants, for finances, for interior design, and even for fashion. I learned a great deal at first, just not about climate. And then, boom. I came across this terrific article from Echo America, as well as a large number of other blog posts and papers. What did I learn? First lesson, respect science. Scientists sequenced the virus, developed tests, learned how infection spreads from person to person, and then cutting edge science led to safe and effective vaccines. It's not that much of a leap from the science of pandemic control to the science of climate change. We ignore both at our own peril. Second lesson, center equity. COVID exposed outrageous disparities in health. With this chart from CDC, showing that Hispanic and African Americans are far more likely to die during the pandemic, that's the red bar, than their share of the population, that's the blue bar. There's a lot behind this chart, including a long legacy of racism and structural racism in housing, medical care, transportation, and the economy. COVID is a lesson that major health challenges expose the weaknesses and injustices of society. If we don't focus on equity, our response to climate will also discriminate. Third lesson, we're all connected. Here's a map of variants of the novel coronavirus from USA Today. Whether humanity can push past the pandemic depends on whether we can support the control of the virus in every corner of the globe. If we fail, a single variant could render our vaccines impotent. Such an important lesson for climate, which also requires global collaboration and consistency to be successful. Fourth lesson, yes, we can. To fight the pandemic, we changed our lives. We changed our economy. COVID commanded attention and action. As the Echo America team wrote in their paper, this shows that we can muster society, policies, and financial resources to address problems of significant importance, namely our climate and health emergency. But this begs an important question. How? How do we muster this capacity? Of course, the people listening to this talk are ready to go but too many of our friends and neighbors are not. How do we get the world to act with the urgency that's needed? As Greta Thunberg recently said, if humans would actually start treating the climate crisis like a crisis, we could really change things. Now, um, it might help at this point in the talk to find someone who teaches a class and has written a book on crisis. Wait a second. Okay, so how, do, how about we start with the definition of crisis? Here's a traditional definition with three components, a threat, short decision time, and surprise. Certainly, COVID meets this definition, but it's not the only way to think about crisis. 
Here's a more modern definition. A crisis is a serious threat to the basic structures or the fundamental values and norms of a system under which time pressure and highly uncertain circumstances necessitates making vital decisions. Here's how a crisis can take shape. As COVID began to spread, people just read the headlines and watched the news stories. This wasn't something that would affect me, they thought. Then, crisis. You probably remember where you were sitting when it became clear your life would ir irrevocably change. Eventually, we got our bearings and took action. Now, can these experiences translate to climate? Let's see what we can learn about crisis from listening to COVID. I'm going to share a few ideas building on some important work already going on in the climate field. First, we might recognize the value of rapid, local, and relevant data. All of us have a favorite COVID dashboard. Here's one from Johns Hopkins, updated every few hours. This highly localized data has helped keep, keep COVID front and center in people's minds, including the threat to themselves and to their loved ones. Here's the NOAA climate dashboard. Impressive, but the x-axis is measured in years. One idea from learning from COVID is to make climate relevant to people every day through measurements of air quality, incidents of extreme weather, and human health impacts of climate on agriculture and other parts of the world. We have a daily weather report. Should we have a daily climate report? Now, for COVID, these data weren't just used to inform individuals about the world around them. They were used to rank jurisdictions, even countries, against each other. Failing in these rankings was an occasion for people to ask, do we need to do more to fight COVID? So it isn't unreasonable to ask what the implications are for climate. Last year, Trust for America's Health and faculty at Johns Hopkins wrote a report on climate policy that ranked every state on climate vulnerability and preparedness. At every level of government, policymakers should be able to answer for their ranking to their constituencies and to their constituents' children and grandchildren. Which brings me to a third idea. If you think back to our definition of crisis as a threat to the norms of a system, you have to recognize the role of young people in threatening the norms of every system. That's what young people do. During the pandemic, we saw this most during the protests for racial justice. It was the activism of young people that led to a national reckoning on race, including new steps towards long overdue change. This mobilization is, of course, very much starting to happen for climate change, with local data, more accountable leadership, and the mobilization of youth, climate change can elicit that sense of crisis that leads to more fundamental reform. We don't have much time to lose. Thank you, and I'd like to acknowledge a number of my colleagues and students who contributed ideas to this presentation. Now, after a short stretch break and message from some of the American Climate Leadership sponsors, we'll be joined by Ensei Witherspoon, the great executive director of the Children's Environmental Health Network, who will moderate the panel on climate justice and health equity. Thank you and take care. Hi everyone, Rebecca Rear back with you to guide you through another set of stretches as we enjoy the American Climate Leadership Summit at the National Health and Climate Forum. Uh, so we're, we focused on arms earlier, so now we're gonna do a little bit of leg work. So we're gonna start again by taking a deep breath in and feel your spine get into alignment and a deep breath out. Great, and then start with one leg. You should be able to lift it up. If you have, you can uh, grab onto a wall or a chair nearby, but you're gonna catch that uh, foot with the corresponding arm on whichever side of the body you're using. And you should feel that stretch, nice stretch in the upper, upper leg here in the thigh. Great, and hold on. And remember, you can be leaning up against a wall, holding onto a chair, and gently let that go. And then we're gonna switch to the other leg. Great, nice stretch. Great. 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 And now you're going to have to put your legs about hip width apart. Great. And then we're going to do a little, little bit of side ab work. So whichever way you want to start, just kind of make sure your body is up 
in alignment or we're going to lean a little bit to the one side if you want you can hold on to some light weights if you have some and then switch to the other side we should be able to feel a nice little little bit of ab work kind of like a stretch on one side of your body great and then we're going to get the heart rate going just a little bit if you're able to join us if you're able to stand please do uh and then we're going to do some soccer ball kicks so like a slight, slight lift in the leg, right? So not all the way up, but a slight lift. And then one, so a little bit of a hop here, a little bit of a hop, a little bit of our heart rate going. I know that the content is so engaging uh, that your heart rate is already up, but we're going to get in some cardio as part of the summit. Little did you know. Great. So it's sort of like running in place, sort of like you're kicking a soccer ball, but we want to make sure that we take time out of our day to exercise a little bit, to care for ourselves so that we can all stay healthy as we advocate for climate, which is tough work. And stop. Great. Another deep breath in. And deep breath out. And then we're going to stretch the thighs again. So catch that foot. Great. Deep breaths. And catch that other foot. Great job. Awesome. Well, now for another word from our sponsors. And remember, take care of yourself to take care of the planet. It's time for a new day, a fresh start, a chance to rebuild America's future. More than ever, America needs resilient and reliable infrastructure. Smart investments in advanced, cleaner energy technologies and electric transportation will create millions of new jobs and strengthen our middle class, which is good for our families, communities, and economy. Go to edf.org slash power up to learn more. The future is now. Let's make it in America. everyone, my name is David Dijak, Executive Director of the National Environmental Health Association. I live in rural Southern Maryland, where the natural rhythms of life are punctuated by the arrival and the departure of ospreys, of purple martins, and monarch butterflies. I want you to know that our 6,500 members work hard every day to ensure the most important parts of your life, your family's health, safety, and financial security are protected and promoted. Together, we can usher our communities into a prosperous and healthy future where the rhythms of life can be sustained for future generations. I'm Deanna Cohen, co-founder and CEO of Plastic Pollution Coalition. We are so pleased to be here for the 10th annual American Climate Leadership Summit, where stopping the crisis of plastic pollution is a national priority. Plastic Pollution Coalition is a global alliance of more than 1,200 organizations, businesses, and thought leaders in 75 countries working toward a more just, equitable world free of plastic pollution and its toxic impact on humans, animals, waterways, the ocean, and the environment. We've pioneered awareness, messaging, and solutions to plastic pollution for 12 years. Whether you are an advocate, policymaker, business leader, student, or concerned individual, you can take action to stop plastic pollution. You can work with us towards a plastic pollution-free America and a plastic pollution-free planet. Visit us at PlasticPollutionCoalition.org to learn more, to support our work, and to join our global coalition. Thank you. We are the Medical Society Consortium on Climate and Health, a coalition of doctors and health professionals mobilizing support for climate solutions that will protect and promote health, equity, and resilience for all Americans. 
Now this is really a unifying concept for public health, primary care, general medicine, emergency medicine, and disaster medicine. It's now, it's urgent, and we got to alert everyone at home, we got to alert everyone in the community, we got to alert our politicians. And if we all contribute just a little bit, it, it makes a big difference.